Shutters. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome, welcome to another episode of Black College Experience. I am Derek Thomas, one half of your Black College Experience team here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we have the founder of Black College Experience in Atlanta, Georgia, Keisha Kelly. What's going on, Kel? Hi, everybody. It's another great weekend in Black College Sports. It's been some shake-ups, some toss-ups, some disappointments. Some surprises, so we'll just hop right into that. Well, um, I wanted to talk about the – you want to go ahead and talk about the scores or you want to talk about the, the Black College Football Hall of Fame first? We'll start with the Black College Football Hall of Fame. All right. So, um, the Black College Football Hall of Fame is in its – I think this is going to be its 10th class, the class of 2019, and seven members are going to be enshrined. First, Emerson Boozer out of University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Hugh Douglas out of Central State. My frat brother, Rich Tombstone Jackson out of Southern University. Frank Lewis out of Grambling State University. Timmy Newsom out of Winston-Salem State University. John Taylor out of Delaware State. You may know John Taylor as he was across from Jerry Rice all those years with the 49ers. Can you imagine that, Kells? Two HBCU legends racking up all those yards and touchdowns. We're super, super, super excited. I'm excited for this class. Not only that, but finally, 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 um, Ace Mumford is going in. Like I said before, yes. this isn't the first Same time. Same that for last for you. So, I'm sorry? I say that for last for you. Yep, so... I'm super excited, um, again, for him and everybody that's going in, but very much so, um, you know, with with Mumford. This is long overdue. We just call him the SWAC terrorizer, but but we're super excited um, for him in this situation. Right, right. I mean, he's well-deserving. All these football players and all the ones who were finalists definitely deserve. I'm pretty sure all of those legends were also – be enshrined soon. Um, so, can't wait to see the next class that's coming up. You know, when you have players like this who, I guess you would say, contribute significantly to college football and also pro football, it makes you see that the HBCU talent has a place in the NFL. And even though the NFL does not draft our talent like it used to, it still has a place in the NFL. We saw that today, Kells, with that video that you posted of Danny taking out Calvin Ridley today. Another case, you look at an a undrafted, uh, a undrafted rookie um, out of an HBCU, then you look at a, a you know a top pick out of Alabama, right. and, and he did. You know, first round pick. Danny, he did. He tried to take him out. He tried to take him down. And like I keep telling people, I live by the motto, um, if they want you, they'll find you. Um, We see this from week to week, not only from players like him, but we see it from players like Chester Rogers. So, um, you know, Isaiah Crowell, it's different players, different times, different teams. So, you know, every time it's it's time to – you know, to, to, to show off and do what we need to do. Um, these HBCU players continue to show us that it does not matter at the end of the day um, what school you come from. Um, it's, it's still football. It's still X's and O's, and they continue to show that um, they're worthy and that they can play in the league just like anyone else. So, you know, it, it's just a great thing. Exactly. I want to welcome my line brother, Patrick Perry on. What's going on, PP? How you doing? Uh, not much. Y'all forgot uh Kadero Hodge, he's contributing for the Rams this year. Oh, well we well we haven't talked about the HBC NFL contributors yet, but yeah, Hodge is having a pretty good season for the Rams. You know, congratulations to him because I, I have made a list of um of HBCU mm-hmm. contributors as far as going on throughout the season, their stats. And um I hadn't I hadn't ha- I didn't have Hodge on my list, but I do know he is definitely a contributor in that Rams offense that's tearing up the NFL, but currently tied with your New Orleans Saints, Kills. Yeah, but I had a factor in this game right now. I haven't seen him out there, so 
yeah, it's it, it's gone on to a time. Like, I don't know what the, the secondary didn't got suspect as ever. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> it went to a tie. Very suspect, but it is what it is. All right. And before we dive into this week's HBCU football action, there was an announcement that impacts the SWAC sent shockwaves through the SWAC uh, in regards to the championship game. No, it wasn't canceled again, but it was relocated. The SWAC championship game was restored back to Birmingham earlier this year. But due to a potential scheduling conflict with Conference USA and UAB, uh, our commission decided to move the SWAC championship game to the highest highest rated C from each conference from each division. So right now it looks like it would be all corn. I know I probably said that wrong. But at one point they were thinking about having it a dual event. The Swag Championship game and the Conference USA Championship game. And that dynamic just doesn't mix to me because we deserve to have our own uh spotlight. Because we are the swag, we don't need to share our spotlight with the Conference USA. So I'm glad that the commissioner made this decision to move the conference championship game to a location where the conference can receive the spotlight that it deserves, Kels. Um, in this case, this is something they had talked about a long time ago. For people that don't know, um, you know, UAB was not expected to be you no know, uh, well, UAB has not had a strong team, so it was not expected to be a front runner. But on the flip side, this was something that was also discussed as a what if with, you know, with the swag because Legion Field is UAB's home field. So, you know, people have all the mumblings and grumblings like, why don't they move? Why don't they move their game? Well, you don't move. You can't move their game because that's their home field. So, exactly. you know, again, this was a what if we, we knew about this a long time ago. It's, it's not it's not a surprise. It's not something that we didn't know about. We knew it was a situation where it could have been what if. So that's how we landed there. Um, there are some other things that are going on in the SWAC um, that I just got wind of. So um, not to break that news and not to rain on anybody's parade that I can't even share that, but oh. it's going to be some other games, major games that are going to be moving that people are not going to be expecting. So, it's some other things that you. are in the works. It's some it's some other things that's in the works. It's some things that are going to be shaking and shifting, especially um, when it comes down to Atlanta. Atlanta seems to be the hub for where everybody seems to want to come. I don't I don't know why, but it's, it's just the place. But it's just like Black Patrick Lanza. said the other day. I don't care where you put a game. Somebody gonna complain and say it's too far. It's not this. It's not that. So it's gonna be a complaint no matter where you exactly. put these games because there really is no neutral site for anything. There's nothing neutral. Alabama A and M is the furthest away, so there's nothing neutral for anybody because if you put it in Jackson, that's gonna be for Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi. If you put it in Birmingham, that's gonna be for Alabama. And them Alabama State. So, you know, either way, it's just going to be a disadvantage for somebody. Somebody has to travel. So, you know, right. again, it's going to be a lot of more changes coming within the next couple of years. And, and like you said, I mean, it, there's always going to be the, I guess you can say, the instance of travel because it's a championship game, you know. So, uh, right now, with Alcorn being the front runner, it looks like the game could possibly be in Lorman. I know Alcorn fans would love to have that because they already feel like they're the SWAC champion already this year, you know. But there's still some games to be decided, you know. Um, speaking of which, we can jump right into SWAC action right now. As far as these games to be decided to uh, Im impact where this SWAC championship game could potentially be played, the best game that happened this past weekend was the Jackson State University Tigers. We know they had a lot of turmoil with the firing of their coach, Coach Hughes, and Coach Herrick was uh, named the interim head coach. No one thought that Jackson State would be to do anything against Prairie View with all the turmoil that the Tigers had endured the past week, two weeks, uh, with the loss to Southern, the loss of their coach, and now coming up to play Prairie View, 
a team that many felt like were the front runners to be represent the Swag West this year. But your Southern Jaguars sure uh, crushed that dream for Prairie View. <laughs> but going forward, Jackson State defeated Prairie View thirty four to twenty eight. You know, Prairie View finally did wake up, but they ran out of time. And Jackson State uh, secures the victory and puts itself in a position that if the Tigers were to win out, uh, they would have a berth in the Squack Championship game. You know, we know that's two games away. I think this is twice in a season that it has been a surprise. Um, I I, I can't say that I honestly thought, you know, because I think we – I'm not sure I know I picked against, you know, coming out for home, coming coming off a a, a heartbreaking 20-3 to loss. It's like, okay, you know, we're coming in there and it's going to be a loss for Southern University. We know Prairie View is going to go in and handle business. And to see a shutout like that 0-38, to it was just, you know, a, a, a complete different turnaround. Yeah. But we also, and we, I continue to speak on, okay, a change of coaches. We all, we all know that coaching changes can make a difference in a lot of things. And we see that happen with Jackson State. But Jackson State did the case of, what's up, of, of what the Saints are doing now. They're, they're get, they got relaxed, and they almost got came back on. So it was just a case that they still pulled away. And it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of their season plays out because – now everything is shaking up on the SWAC side, east and west. It's shaking up in every conference. There's so much going on. You don't know who's going where. Exactly. Oh, I can't wait to get to the SEAC. I can't wait to get over there to talk about with that. But, PP, you know, Jackson State is our biggest rival with us being Delta Devils. What do you think about Jackson State, even with all the turmoil that they've had this year, if they were to win out, have a berth in the SWAC championship game? Oh, man. I mean, my Mississippi side said I want to see it because it would, you know, that Jackson State right now leading the uh, FCS in attendance, they going to pack, they will pack that stadium out. So I want to see it from that standpoint. You know, I think, you know, they got to, that defense is always going to be their strong point. That'll right. keep them, that will always keep them in games. So, I'm interested to see how this how this is going to roll out, especially going into next week, which we I know y'all going to talk about. But go ahead. Right. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I grew up a Tiger, even though I'm a Delta Devil. I would like nothing more than for Jackson State to close the door on our corner. That would rile those Braves up some kind of offer. We all know how our corner folks get when things don't go their way. I did think that would be something awful. What you think about that, Kels? I think that would be awesome. What you think about that, Kels? And I think, like, again, one of the things is because it's so – this is what you call just good swag football. Yeah. Because you don't know what's going to happen at, at any at any given moment, which, like you said, you're ready to talk about the SEAC, and that's going to be one of the pressers because you got teams that are one and two, two and two, and the only thing that matters is these conference games. Division, so, yeah. you know – Alcorn has already pretty much in their minds marked it that they're going on to the SWAC championship, that everything they're going to be playing at home and everything is all good for them. We still got season games left. Yes, we do. So let's take a commercial break and then come back. All right, we'll be right back in 31 seconds for more Black College Experience where we'll finish up talking about SWAC football. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. All right, we're back with more Black College Experience and to go on through the rest of the sweat games. Uh, Gramley State hosted our Delta Devils for homecoming, PP. And we gave those Tigers a scare. I told you. <laughs> you know, at the two-yard line, unfortunately, we threw a pass on fourth down and it was knocked away. And they gave Gramlin the ball back. But our defense stopped Gramlin with another chance to take over this game and ruin homecoming for Gramlin. The 
king of the swag loses to Valley had a chance to happen, but we fumbled the ball the way and Gramlin recovered and they ran out the time and secured their homecoming victory. And that allowed all the Gramlin State I, University Tigers to breathe. Wait a minute. I have never in my life we was just we was like like it, it was a and it, you know it's hard when you can't see something. It's yes. hard when you just gotta read the update. So it's really you're just like, oh my God. And you see it. And then you but but this is not honestly. This is not the first game that that you know that Valley gave somebody hell. Valley gave um, Pine Bluff hell. Y'all came gave back each other and hell and came back and won the game. So in my mind, I was like, yeah, they gonna come back and win. But the loss wasn't like a zero to twenty four. The loss wasn't even bad. The loss twenty four nineteen. So y'all yeah. played a great game. Just a little bit more time. And y'all well, we could have got that score from back. two. That's ball game. But here's the thing, kid. We all know Graham the Tiger fans always going live. I couldn't get a single Graham the Tiger to go live to show me that game because they knew they're not going to meet it now because they escaped with the victory. They knew they had a chance to lose to Valley, and that would have just rained on all their parades. I could see Chad's face now. Not answering my phone calls, saying, Derek, I won't talk to you because I won't talk noise. You know, but unfortunately my Delta Devil was a let let the tiger escape. But I'm proud of the effort. Uh Coach Dancy has our Delta Devils playing well. And this just bodes well for the future and what he can possibly build in Itabina. If we can hang with Gramlin, even though this is not the Gramlin team of last year, but they have more talent than us. We hung with them, had a chance to win. So, I'm proud. Uh, up next, uh, Alabama a and defeats Arkansas Pine Bluff 45-14 to to spoil homecoming for the Golden Lions. Uh, <laughs> Akil Glass kills. He's making a case for Swack Offensive Player of the Year. This is his second breakout game. He is – he was – he had a good games last year as a true freshman, but I think he's now rounding in the form. And he has two more years left to play. He's going to make an assault on passing records for Alabama a and I know Jen is happy. I, I tried to because Alabama a and is a pretty young team. Um, and, of course, you know, with Coach Maynard just coming in, tried to tell people that this would be the case where Alabama a and they would try to make a splash. They're going to make some kind of noise uh, in the East. Um this year, and so you can see that it's it's slowly coming in. Once again, if we go back to um, Gulf Gulf Coast Challenge, um, you know the Jaguars were able to just slide by by two points, twenty seven twenty nine. That game could easily win any other way. Um, it's just the you know at the fact he got stuffed at the at the one yard line and then the outside kick. So you know that that was the ball game, but that game could have easily went either way, to two points. So and then you see what they did with Alabama State. You see what they did in other games. So, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, more competitive, I think, for them next year. I, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, up next, we want to talk about uh, Alabama. i uh, just close my thing. Uh, Alabama State defeating Texas Southern 30-21. to You know, the Hornets, you know, getting another W. And they needed that win. But – the next game is going to be our Beast of the East, Alcorn State, on the road in New Mexico State, uh, losing 52-42. to 42. But, P.P., Alcorn was getting beaten pretty bad, but they walked, they walked New Mexico State down to at least be down by three. So when I saw you post that, I was like, well, look at the Braves fighting back. But, unfortunately, they faltered, and New Mexico State extended the lead, and Alcorn falls 52-42, to 42, a gallant, gallant effort by the Braves against uh, a FBS opponent. Yeah, I mean, Alcorn is. I said Alcorn been the most consistent as far as competing out of conference against those type of schools. They, I mean, McNair I guess he, whatever he says to them as far as in the locker room competing against them, it works because they almost beat Southern Miss, they almost beat FIU, and then they what is it? Put up forty two on an FBS team, so. Yeah, I mean, they have the mind, rise. I mean, the right mindset as far as going in and, and no game. Right. 
And Noah Johnson had a stellar game, completed 26 of 37 passes for 316 yards and four touchdowns to Dale Harris, Callaway Long, Radarius Anderson, Chris Blair, and Deshaun Waller. And I also added 16 rushes for 138 yards. But well, Alcorn gets to rest before they have to face Jackson State. So the Braves will be well rested when that rivalry game mm. is to be played. Um, before we jump over to the MIAC, just want to run down some, some soccer and volleyball. You know, those sports are, are heading toward the end. Uh, the SWAC tournament in volleyball will be November 16th. Uh, but right now, in SWAC volleyball, uh, Alabama A and M was sixteen and zero, but they just suffered their first conference loss. So they're sixteen and one. Alabama State's fifteen and two. Jackson State's nine and six. Southern your Jags are nine and eight. Texas Southern at eight and eight. Grambling at six and ten. Also with UAPB at six and ten. And Prairie View as well. All corn at five and twelve. And people you dealt to that was at the bottom at two and fourteen in volleyball. So, you know, congratulations to these young ladies. They've been playing hard all year long. Uh, they definitely deserve recognition uh, for even though their sport's not a revenue generating sport, they compete and they deserve to be recognized. Uh, in soccer, we want to congratulate Howard as they defeated I had it up here. They won. Grambling. Swag, they defeated Grambling for the soccer title. They defeated to Grambling one to zero today, and they defeated Southern in double overtime the other day. So yeah, yes, they defeated indeed. Grambling one to zero. And that it just won. sounds weird. How it sounds weird winning a SWAC championship, but that's because the MEAC uh, doesn't sponsor soccer. So we welcome yeah, any SWAC, institution, yeah, any HBC tournament, institution yeah. uh, that wants to join the SWAC and compete in soccer. So congratulations to Howard. All right. So now we're ready to head over. Oh, before we go, we need to announce this. In cross country, uh, the UAPB men and the Alabama State women were the cross country champs in the SWAT. Now, jumping over into the MEAC, I mean, this this league, I mean, we thought we knew what was going to happen in this league, Kells, at the beginning of the season. Everybody felt like North Carolina and T was going to whoop everybody, but they had an early loss. Then FAMU emerges as the bully of the MEAC, but every game has to be played. They took on Howard, and we all picked Howard, I think, except for a couple people. I picked, I'm, I'm sorry, FAMU, and Howard upsets FAMU, denies the Rattlers the MEAC championship. And now North Carolina a t now has a life or chance to possibly regain its preseason form as the MEAC possible champion. Kels, what do you think about FAMU getting upset by Howard? Because we know that quarterback, Kaylee Newton, has the ability. But Well, again, you know, this is a case where anything can happen. Um, I think it's also a situation where, you know, um, Bethune Cookman, they're thinking that Bethune Cookman is going to beat Sam U. How true that is, I don't know. So it's kind of like a toss up right now. Over that's why I said in, in all sides of football and every conference, you really can't tell who's going to do what because even if Sam U's the front runner one week, anything could happen and North Carolina and T could even sneak back in. So, you know, exactly. I think it comes down to like the last week or two before we'll even know who who's going to even be playing on that side. But, they were trying to make it a berth as to where they were playing for the championship and the celebration ball at the same, you know, same thing. So we'll see what happens. But um, we did. We had this conversation back and forth. We knew that Howard started off strong. We know what Kaylin Newton can do. Uh, Kaylin, I mean, it's just he puts up the numbers. He he performs. But at the end of the day, we're like, okay, what's going on um, as far as, um, you know, this year? So, you know, it's, it's just good to see, you know, it's, it's going to be a question mark about who's playing where. And it's like one minute we're like, okay, spam you. Then it's like Howard. Then it's like it could be Bethune Cookman. So, you know, it's, it's just a lot of camaraderie built right now around every conference. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's excitement all around them in HBCU football. But to run down these other scores, who would have thought that after 
losing all of their games up until last week. That Delaware State would be on a win streak. They are. They defeated Savannah State, winning their second straight. You know, and we all picked Savannah State that game. I mean, who know who would have thought that the, that Delaware State would be on a two-game win streak? They defeated Savannah State twenty-five to six. Uh, also, Bethune Cookman held off Morgan State thirty to twenty-eight. Hard fought battle there for homecoming. Ed Waters was blown out by North Carolina Central. It's North Carolina Central's homecoming, and um, also what what does North Carolina T call their homecoming, Kels? The greatest homecoming. It's called G Ho. So G Ho is simply greatest homecoming on earth. Is what that yes, means. Yes, indeed. So uh, I, I, I've never been. Uh, I would like to go one day to experience this greatest homecoming on earth. But North Carolina A&T defended the greatest homecoming on earth, defeating Norfolk State 37-20. to 20. And like we said, getting a gift from Howard uh, gives life back to the Aggies that they can potentially represent the MEAC in the Celebration Bowl. You know, because the MEAC doesn't have a championship game, so it would be nice to see FAMU. Do, do they play this year? I don't think they play this year, do they? No. Play. No, no, they don't. Mm-mm. So it would be nice to see the two top teams in the MEAC go at it for an outright champion like we do here in the SWAC. But, you know, they do what they do and we do what we do. So it works for the leagues uh, to do different things, I guess. But it would be nice to see those two go at it uh, and, and just erase everything on the field and get it, get it going once we get to championship time. But uh, volleyball – uh, for the MEAC. Let's see here. All right, in the Northern Division, Howard sits at undefeated. They're eight and zero. Madden Eastern Shore is five and two. Morgan State four and three. Copper State three and four. Norfolk State two and six. And Delaware State defeated at zero and seven in the MEAC. In the Southern Division, FAMU sits at seven and one. North Carolina NT and Bethune Cookman both sit at five and three. NC Central is at three and five. Savannah State at two and five. And South Carolina State has won one game all year, but they sit at one and six in the MEAC. So, um, you know, conference championships will be coming down the line soon in the MEAC, just like in the SWAC. But it's neither here or there. But before we jump over to um, the SEAC, I want to congratulate Howard. They hired Victoria Tyson as softball coach, and she is known as a pitching guru. So, you know, I guess we're going to see uh, how Howard does on the softball diamond this year, hiring a pitching guru. But that's all we have for the MEAC. Kelsh, you have some news you want to announce about Hampton. Okay. For everyone that does not know, this week um, Hampton did make another move. Um, and for people that don't know, Hampton is continuously um, setting trends and doing things as being the first. So um, this week, uh, the Rams, they did make history um, again by becoming the first HBCU to sponsor a Division I women's triathlon program. They're the only seven Division I program in the country. Uh, Hampton University this week, they welcomed the USA Triathlon C- uh, CEO Ricky Harris and Sika Henry, uh, the top African-American female triathlete in the country to participate uh, in the actual announcement. Now, this actually adds on to the Pirates um, as best as they are the only one with the triathlon team. They're also the only one with a um, co-ed nationally ranked sailing team as well as men's lacrosse team. So we call this money moves. They're making money moves. They're doing other sports that other people can't touch right now. And I think that's awesome. I mean, they have triathlon, uh, a dive team, and they have a national rank sailing team as well, correct? And that's what I said. The nas- that's what I said, the right. co-ed nationally ranked sailing team. Right. Yeah, and, and, and then the and, men's lacrosse team. I mean, those are sports that HBCUs normally have not even thought about participating in. So kudos to Hampton and our good friend Paul up there, you know, building bridges to success in sports where 
know, people wouldn't think that HBCUs would compete. And they're making noise. They're, they're, they're making noise. They're being successful. Um, I can't wait to see how this triathlon team competes. And because, you know, um, when you have triathlons and triathletes, I mean, those individuals can go on to become Olympic hopefuls. So we all know HBCU athletes have excelled in track and field, definitely out of the CIA, out of SAU. So if Howard is able to build a successful triathlon program, who knows, the next potential triathlon, triathlon Olympic champion could come from an HBCU. Just another sport where HBCUs can find a niche where we can put our athletes and student athletes on par with schools who wouldn't who wouldn't think that we would be to compete with them. So, you know, I just think that that's an amazing thing uh, for this because when the news came out, I was like, well, I wonder what it's going to be. So uh, I didn't think it was going to be that big, but Kel, you, you educated me on it. I'm glad you did, and I'm just glad for Hampton. All right. Now, uh, jumping over, before we jump over to the SEAC, I want to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back to talk about all the happenings in the SEAC, and then we'll talk about the happenings in the CIAA and then the GCAC, and then the rest of our football scores in HBCU sports. We'll be right back in about 25 seconds. Are you interested in attending an historically black college or university? Hello, my name is Robert Mason. I'm president and founder of the Common Black College application. Our application allows you to apply to any number of 44 historically black colleges and universities at the same time for only $35. So visit our website at www.commonblackcollegeapp.com to apply now. Thank you and get educated. All right, we're back with more black college experience. And now we're going to talk about the football recap in the SEAC. I mean, this is a league that's in Division Two, but they play some good football, good HBCU football in the SEAC. And the first score I want to talk about is going to be Central versus Lane. Central had a resurgence. They, 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 they had a pretty good season going on, but they had a few losses. But, you know, this week on the, on the Marauders – uh, hit list was Lane, the Lane Dragons, and the Marauders slayed the Dragons 45 to 22. Um, it's the final game of the 2008 season for Central, and the with the victory CSU finishes with an overall five and five mark and three and three ledger in the SEAC play. Lane falls to three and six on the season with a two and four record in the SEAC. Up next. Morehouse versus Clark Atlanta. Now, Kells, um, Morehouse started the season, I think, what, 6 0, correct? Morehouse started the season undefeated. Um, first team they took down was Pine Bluff. Um, and and they, they did. They appeared to be rolling. But as, as you know, the games that are most important are your conference games. And that first loss came to Albany State in. That was that was a tough loss for them. That was a conference game. And, you know, they lost conference games. And the thing is now, you know, going out there, yesterday was just for uh, the battle of the ABC is what they call it. It's just for bragging rights, the battle of the ABC, just to see who gets bragging rights. But, um, you know, just having a conversation with someone, you know, I'm just talking about the difference and all the stuff that actually went on. It just looks like, um, you know, they, they lost hope. They lost hope when they start taking the – taking the uh, the losses and they're a good team they're just young and they're not disciplined and so it's like they lost focus when they lost and when they lost they lost they lost hope they lost confidence and the focus was gone so you know they took that L and they they ended the season um uh 30 13 they lost it was 30 to 13 so right. um you know I did get a chance to talk to um Kevin Ramsey which is the um Clark Atlanta's head coach. If y'all ever if you ever get a chance to meet him, I call him the countryest coach. Um, <laughs> he's like he's the zoot suit type hats and everything. He's real fancy on the sidelines, but he is one of my favorite coaches. Yes, indeed. And to talk more about this game, you know, like you said, Morehouse started off six and zero, and they finished the season one and three to finish seven and three, three and three in the SEAC. Clark finishes three and seven, two and three in the SEAC. And, you know, in his final game as a Panther, 
Roger Thomas ran for 199 yards uh, for the victory. Up next, we have Benedict shutting out Kentucky State 18-0. Uh, then Albany State in the Fountain Classic just overflowed the fountain on Fort Valley 40-6. You know, so and we know Albany State will be playing in the in the SEAC championship game. Now, who they're going to be playing is going to be the game that we're going to talk about next. Miles versus Tuskegee Kills. Now, when you look at this game, which which is a rivalry game because both schools are located in Alabama. I mean, Tuskegee has been the cream of the crop in the SEAC for years. They have competed for almost more championships than anyone, you know. And Miles started the season 0-5. Everyone looked at them as they were dead in the water. We weren't picking them in our weekly pick But they went on a 4-1 record to clinch their spot in the SEAC championship game. And, and they defeated Tuskegee 31-27. to Kels, you're an Alabama girl. Talk about this game and what it what it means to the people in this area for Miles to defeat Tuskegee and clinch their well, in the SEAC title game. Well, for people that don't know, if you don't know, you don't follow, this is just a kind of battle of the revenge because they dropped it to them last year. Um, it came down to Miles and Tuskegee last year, and Tuskegee went on to win. Um, and, you know, Coach talks about it. Um, coach um, – Miles' coach has – he lost his wife. Um, he lost one of his co- – one of his coaches lost their son. So he's been dealing with a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff that went on that he has had to battle within the time. So to say that you came back from that – and the funny thing is is that Miles has been winning games on last-minute, last-second plays like the last couple of All games. season long. So they're, they've been coming back and coming back, and yesterday was the last-second play. And, you know, um, to say that they've done that is just pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. So, you know, again, I've, I got the opportunity to talk to Coach Ruffin um, when we were, you know, when we had media day. And, you know, we talk about, of course, of course the predictive order of finish. But really, again, another great guy. Um, I actually did try to get them on. And, you know, it's just some no, things going it, back no. and forth with their, you know, with his SID. But, understandably when they're going into championship time and all of that stuff, you just have to kind of wait on their schedule. Exactly. And now the SEAC title game will be in Alabama on the campus of Miles College. And the Miles College Bears will be facing against the Albany State Rams. And Albany State has been on an absolute tear. They actually defeated Miles early in the year, I think, so you have that aspect, but we know how hard it is to beat a team twice. But before we move further, there was one person in our weekly pick em that picked Miles to win this game. I know what our board says. I accidentally picked Tuskegee. My bad, LB. PP, man, where's your crystal ball and let me borrow it, man? How did you know that Miles was going to beat Tuskegee? Oh, man, it's like, let's see, basically, I mean, it's like, uh, what is it, Grambling's on the road, momentum, man, momentum, man, Mo, Miles turning around, and they playing probably some of the best football in the conference right now, so you just have to, just, you had that gut feeling, man. And, right, and, 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 and congratulations to Miles, I mean, they earned it, you know, they finished Four and six on the season, four or two in the SEAC West. You know, and the Golden Bears, how they won this game, they had a 27 yard touchdown pass from Daniel Smith to Leonard Tyree with a minute 45 remaining in the fourth quarter. Then they forced four incomplete passes on the ensuing series. The last coming with 16 seconds left, which was the last gasp for Tuskegee. And they sealed the win and a trip to play at home. For the SEAC title, which, thanks to Kells, I applied for credentials to the SEAC title game. And I think, Kells, you're going to be there too, right? More than likely, it's going to come down to a last-minute um, decision right. for me. It just depends. Um, but more than likely, I will be. 
And so hopefully I get a chance to go to be my first time witnessing a SEAC title game, a SEAC game in its entirety ever. I've never watched a SEAC HBCU team play football. So it'll be a first for me uh, to drive up to Miles College. You know, I'm going to get a chance to visit some family that I have in the Birmingham area. Um, so it'll be a, a, a business and a personal trip for me and get a chance to see some good HBCU football because this will be for the SEAC championship. And, you know, with Albany State just being as dumb as they are, not many people are probably going to think that Miles are going to win this game. But Miles has let you know we can start 0-5, get on a roll, beat this, the team that everybody felt was going to be the strongest team in the SEAC and solidify our spot to play for a championship. So congratulations to the Miles Bears. They, when you play hard and you execute, you know, this is what this is what you get. And kids, I know you're probably happy. Your Saints just gave the Rams their first loss of the season. And I know you're happy about that. It, it, it is. And in this case, it's not about how you start, it's how you finish. When you you know when you start talking about these games, and most importantly, it's the games that you have to win that they came away with the the win zone. So you know you beat you get the conference game and you win those games. Those are the most important games. And with other teams, you know, it's kind of like okay, well, if this team lost and this team won, and I won here or I lost, you know, it's a little bit more leverage. But in this case, you know, we'll we'll see how um, Miles actually matches up with. Uh, Albany State, um, I, I can it's right now, Albany State is a well or machine. I can tell you that much. So we'll see how this plays out. All right. And before we move on to the CIAA, we're going to talk some SEAC volleyball. And the SEAC volleyball tournament will start on tomorrow in Birmingham, Alabama, in the Birmingham Crossplex from November 5th to November 7th. Um, if you want to see live stats, you can visit the CX website. Tickets are free. So if you're living in the Birmingham area, come root for these young ladies as they vie for a CX championship. Uh, but to run down the volleyball, where is it? The standings for volleyball in the East. We have Albany State at 11-4, Clark Atlanta at 10-5, Payne at 8-7, Benedict at 5-9, Fort Valley at 5-11. and 11. In the West, we have undefeated Spring Hill, ranked Spring, Spring Hill. We have Kentucky State, our good buddy, Kels, Coach Gouri, uh sitting at 14-3 in the SEAC, trying to get her first SEAC championship. Tuskegee sitting at 12-5. Lamont on at eight and nine, Central State at four and thirteen, and Lane and Miles, excuse me, bringing up the rear at two and fifteen. So, congratulations to these student athletes as well, because you know we know they've been working hard, making grades, and spiking and getting balls. So, you know, getting blocks. I'm sorry, blocking balls. So, you know, congratulations to these young ladies. They work hard, so that they deserve. Your uh, your admiration and and to be cheered for. So hopefully we have a good crowd come out to the SEAC volleyball tournament starting tomorrow in Birmingham, and just to give these young ladies a nice crowd to know that hey, as HBCU fans, you know you you you, you want to cheer them on. Now jumping over to the CIAA. All right. First, before we jump into any games, want to congratulate. Uh, Commissioner McWilliams for being awarded the Charlotte Power 15 Award. Uh, that is an award uh, based off, you know, uh, as far as being in the digital and technology world. So I want to congratulate Commissioner McWilliams for winning that award. And she's representing the CIAA very well. And she is leading the CIAA uh, into, you know, great heights. You know, we had, know you had that, that issue with the, uh, with the title games being moved, that she 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 steered the CIAA through that storm of water, and and they come out of it strong. Uh, but to talk about what's going on now, this the road to Salem has been set. 
Our good buddy, my favorite HBCU football quarterback, Bowie State's Amir Hall, will face Fayetteville State in the 2018 CIAA Football Championship. Fayetteville State making its second straight uh, trip to the football championship. And, you know, they're going to hope to try to come out with a victory this year. But I don't think so. You know, I, I think I think Bowie State's going to handle the business, you know, because I just – I'm a fan of Amir Hall. I just don't think Fayetteville State's going to win again. But um, to run down the scores from this week's games, uh, Virginia Union versus Virginia State. I'm going to call this the Battle of Virginia. And it was won by Virginia Union. 46 to 19, uh, Bowie State and, and Amir Hall defeat Elizabeth City State 49 to 7. Livingstone defeats Johnson C. Smith. Now, Kells and PP, how did y'all figure that Livingstone was going to beat Johnson C. Smith? Really? How do we? How do we figure that? You sound like Johnson C. Smith been playing the best football. They haven't. Both of them have not played good football this year. But they Johnson haven't. Smith had a good game last week. They have I, not I been playing. Know. You act like they've been playing like they like <laughs> like they like ten and one or something. No, no they're not. That's probably but, just a gamble and a guess. That's a gamble and a guess. Yeah, and, no, and, and that gamble played play it off for no. you. That gamble paid off for you. Now, um, up next is Chawan versus Lincoln, Pennsylvania. 56-7 victory for Chawan. And even oh, though wow. West Fayetteville State is going to be playing for a CIAA championship game, Winston Stadium State said, you know what, we're going to give y'all one buff whooping to remember. And they defeated Fayetteville State 51-21. to To guess the state, like, you know what, we should be in that title game. We just whooped them. But – you didn't win enough games, win some same state. But this whooping that the Rams put on the Broncos, I mean, Kells, 30 points? And this team is going to play for a tight title game against one of the most prolific quarterbacks in CIAA history? What you think about that? I think it, it's, it's a good thing. And, again, like I said, I've, I've been to Salem Stadium. I did. I got a chance to go to Salem, Salem Stadium in January. Um, this is actually where the HBCU uh, Spirit Bowl took place. Um, very cold, very, very cold in January. I actually missed the snow by one day. So I would love, love, love to see Amir. But since we know Amir is not graduating yet, correct, or is he graduating? He's a senior. He's done, I think. Yeah, he's, he's a senior. So I guess I won't get to see him play in at least one more game. But, however, if he could win the Deacon Jones Award again and come down here to the Black uh, Football College Hall of Fame, I could perhaps see him then. But yeah. um, I would love to see him in person. Definitely got to try to get him as a guest on Black College Experience, you know, because I've been a fan of this guy for a while. I mean, I hope he gets a chance to showcase his skills in the NFL or one of these other professional football leagues that are sprouting up. You know, but he is a, a drop back passer with the ability to, to run. So, you know, he needs a little weight put on him. But what better way to put the weight on than practicing and turning yourself into a professional football player, which I really hope he gets a chance to do. Uh, but the last game for this week was Shaw versus St. Aug. And the Shaw Bears defeated the St. Augustine Eagles. I'm sorry, I always call them Eagles. They're the Falcons. My bad, St. Aug. Don't y'all come beat me up. Uh, the Shaw Bears defeated the St. Augustine Falcons 27-10. to And next week's game, Chowan will play Shaw. I text you because I want to, you know, with the title game I already decided, why is this game being played? But, hey, it's another football game for HBCU players to showcase their skills. So, next week, Chowan will be playing Shaw. And the big show will be November 10th. will be Fairville State versus Bowie State, which you, I'm going to predict Bowie State to win. So, you know, I'm not going to pick against Amir. But um, we're done with the CIAA, but we still have some more. Uh, I'm sorry, I got to talk about volleyball. My bad, my bad. All right, get the volleyball up. All right, so... In in volleyball, 
Virginia State in the Northern Division sits at six and two. Virginia Union at seven and one. Chowan at seven and one. Liberty City State four and four. Lincoln at one and eight. Bowie at zero oh and nine. Shaw Bears, our, our, our good friend, Coach Gorey's former team, seems to be doing well in her absence. They're sitting at nine and one in the division. Johnson C. Smith at eight and two. Winston Salem State at six and three. Fairville State at six and two. Livingstone at three and seven, and Claflin and St. Aug sitting at defeated at 0 and 9 and 0 and 8, respectively, in the CIAA's Northern Division. Now, um, jumping over to the cross country, congratulations to the Fairville women and the Virginia State men for becoming cross country champions. And we already talked about in the GCAC about North Carolina Central defeating. Ed Waters for homecoming. But we have some basketball going on in the GCAC. And Selma University uh, lost to Talladega 97-71. Suno was well, defeated by... Before you... You kind of crossing over to the different sports. Why are you still in cross country? Um, Morehouse did just do a three-peat. Uh, I'm for sorry, cross country, they My bad. 16, 17, and 18. This is their third championship. So on Friday, they did get their third championship with Coach Hill um, in cross country. And for people that don't know, cross Coach Hill is a very legendary coach. Several, several, several championships. Yes, indeed. And um, in the GCAC, uh, Dillard uh, defeats University of the Virgin Islands 98 to 81. And I think Mississippi University for Women loses to Tougaloo, nine and four to sixty-five. And uh, I got a, I put a, uh, a little try to get Coach Thomas Biddle to be a guest on the show, waiting to get a response back from him, so he can come on and talk about his career and how he's building Tougaloo up. Uh, Carver College loses to Dillard, ninety-two to fifty-one. On the women's side, uh, Philander Smith defeats. Wow, this is a this is a whooping for you. They defeat Jarvis Christian College 106-24. Uh, Talladega defeats Selena University. I'm sorry, Selma University 118-72. Suno loses to Wilder College 67-61. Wilder College can win more than the Bakes, y'all. Uh, Mississippi University women loses to Tougaloo women 84-72. Langston University loses to Xavier 75-71. And Xavier also defeated... Florida Memorial 76 to 58 in bas- women's basketball. In volleyball, Xavier blanked two glue 3 to 0. And Philander Smith blanked Rust 3 to 0. And Dillard was blanked by Loyola, Loyola 3 to 0. Now, uh, for our independent schools, have some more f- football scores. And this is a game that we picked Southeast Missouri State defeated Tennessee State 38 to 21. Hampton blows out soon. I think that's SUNY Maritime, fifty-one to ten. West Virginia State defeats Urbana, thirty-one to twenty-eight. Panhandle puts the pan to Texas College, fifty-nine to three, and Tarleton State defeats Lincoln, Missouri, fifty-nine to three. Now we got about seven minutes left in our show. But before we talk about our HBCU NFL stars, we have to recognize the winner of our Week 10 BCE Pickle. The champ is here! The yes, champ is here! The champ is here! Keisha Kelly wins the BCE Week 10 Championship. With an 11-4 record, she was tied with Patrick Perry this week, 11-4, but went to the top tiebreaker, which she won by having the lowest combined points of score selection. So, Kels, how does it feel to be the Week 10 BC Pick'em champ? First of all, i like to thank my mom. i like to thank my dad. i like to thank everybody that has supported me in this championship. So, I'm moving on to the next round, it appears. But it, I don't know. How did you like? How did you do the point? Well, how did you do the point? Uh, let me pull it up. Um, okay. It was whoever had the. What I did was I I added your, like when you, you your score, 
I don't have it on me right now because I didn't know you was gonna ask me that. But um, okay. where is it? I have it in here. Everybody been sending messages. Okay, what it is is um, the final score was forty six to nineteen, and so what I did was I took whatever score you said they had and I uh, subtracted it, and whoever had the lowest points from point scored versus scored against, that's how you would declare the champion. Um, and when, as far as points scored, you had a difference of eight points. As far as points scored against, you had a difference of five points for a total of 13 points. Uh, for Patrick, as far as points scored, he had a difference of five points. Scored against, he had a difference of 16 points, which was 21 points. So with you scoring 13 points and him scoring 21, that makes you the winner because you scored, you guessed the, 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 the closest score. So congratulations on your Week 10 championship. And, you know, this week our records were I went 10 and 5. You and PP went 11 and 4. Carlos went 8 and 7. Manning went 7 and 8. I'm glad Manning was 7 and 8 because we trying to catch Manning. He's been leading in wins all season long. And he's been hoping that he could hold on to that season lead. And uh, But hopefully one of us will catch him before the season ends. Uh, Mo also went 7 and 8. BJ went 9 and 6. Jen went eight and seven, and Doctor Prince went nine and six. So you know, be, check our Facebook page and our Twitter on tomorrow as I work on the season records, so that you can see where everybody's sitting as far as uh, the wins and losses and win percentages. So you know, Kels, I think you're gonna almost catch BJ if you have another good week and he has another bad week. Oh, so I think so. At this time, you see that anything can happen. So. PJ, I'm coming for uh, I'm coming for who you said, BJ? Uh, Manny. Oh, I'm coming for Manny's spot. Yes, indeed. Jaguar versus a tiger. All right, so we got about three minutes left in our show tonight. But before we get out of here, I, I want to highlight uh, our HBCU alums who are doing well in the NFL. And uh, I, if I left someone out, please forgive me. You know, uh, I started putting this list together tonight. Uh, but starting first, Anton Bethea at the Cardinals. He's the old man of the group. He has, at 13 years in the NFL, he has 67 tackles and one sack. Also for the Cardinals, Rodney Gunter out of Delaware State. I'm sorry, Bethea was out of Howard. Rodney Gunter, defensive tackle out of Delaware State. Is, out, is outperforming Robert Kimdichi in- 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 out of Ole Miss, a first-round draft pick. He has 16 tackles and a half a sack. And Grambling's Chad Williams has 11 catches for 113 yards and one touchdown. All right. Uh, Anthony Levine out of Tennessee State, the DB slash linebacker, has 20 tackles and one interception. The last turn still on the practice squad. Um, for the Bears, uh, Tariq Cohen has been a dual threat, triple threat, I'm sorry, for the Bears. In the rushing game, he has 200, 224 yards and one touchdown. Receiving, he has 30 receptions for 398 yards and three touchdowns. That's where Tariq has been doing the majority of his damage is in the receiving game. He also returns punts an 11-yard clip. Uh, we also know Broncos kicker Marquette King, punter Marquette King, has been having another good year. Uh, for the Colts, they have three HBCU players. And we have first the NFL's leading tackler, rookie, Darius Maniac Lenard out of South Carolina State. He has 88 total tackle skills, and he has four sacks on the year. So he has to be a front runner for NFL Rookie Defensive Player of the Year. And if he continues to still play, even though the Colts aren't having a good season, he has to get some votes for overall NFL Defensive Player of the Year because he's leading the league in total tackles. And up next, we have Chester Rogers, a wide receiver out of Grambling. He has 32 catches for 295 yards and one touchdown. Grover Stewart out of Albany State has nine tackles. All right. And uh, for the Dolphins, we want to uh, wish William Hayes out of Winston Salem State a, a recovery, swift recovery. He tore his knee up trying to avoid sacking a quarterback for that crazy quarterback rule they have now. So, William Hayes. Swift recovery, get back so you can get some more sacks. Uh, and your Saints have Teron Armstead, offensive lineman out of UAPB. 
All right, the Giants uh, have Antonio Hamilton out of South Carolina State and also Jaleel Davis out of Bethune-Cookman, both playing on special teams. The Jets have two HBCU alums, running back Virginia State, Trent Cannon has 29 yards rushing. He also returns kicks and punts and has a couple tackles on special teams. Isaiah Correll out of Alabama State has 484 yards rushing and five touchdowns. Um, Brandon Parker is on the Raiders squad. And Danny Johnson kills. Um, had a pretty good game for the Redskins this year, like we said earlier. I mean, he he, he he's finding in some snaps on defense. And we know that you Southern Jaguars are excited about that. So talk to us about, again, how did you feel seeing Danny perform today? Okay, so before we wrap this up, this was a very – it was a very good game um, watching, again, a undrafted rookie um, in Danny Johnson coming after a first-round pick uh, out of Alabama, uh, Calvin Ridley, with the Reds uh, – excuse me, with the Atlanta Falcons now. The Redskins didn't win, but however, just seeing, you know, seeing the determination, seeing the focus, seeing the fire in Danny, um, playing really well and covered. So, you know, it, it was a good thing. And once again, as I said in the beginning of the show, you know, it, it just shows that our athletes are showing that they belong. You know, we can play in the same league. There's no difference because once we get there, it's no difference. We're all on the same team now. Exactly. I agree with you. So, Kels, on that note, go ahead and close us out. All next right. week, um, we are closing this out right now. Uh, next week, make sure you tune into uh, Black College Experience. Again, we'd like to change some things up as uh, football season is getting ready to close out. Basketball season is getting ready to creep on in here. Um, we do so have dope. a former uh, basketball player from Coppin State. Her name is Monique, so she will join us next week to give uh, give us her story. Yes, indeed. And I can't wait to have that interview. She has an amazing resume. Can't wait to hear her story and her tell everyone, you know, what she's doing now and how her HBCU journey shaped her. So that's our show for tonight. Rest in heaven with Kiki. Bub loves you. Everyone have a good night.